And we're going to just um, continue our series this morning uh, in Ephesians. If you've got a Bible, I highly recommend that you do um, grab a Bible uh, or open your phone if you've got a Bible app. Uh, we're in the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 4. And uh, as a church, we've been going through this, this letter that's in the New Testament. Um, it's, it's, a great, um, it's a great summary of the gospel, of the good news about what Jesus has done for us and how it might affect the way we live. And so we've been looking at a chapter each, each uh, celebration service, and we're at chapter 4 today. We read the first half of chapter 4 last celebration we're in second half of chapter four and we're running into the first bit of chapter five as well um, so i'm going to read from uh, chapter four verse 17 and if you want to follow along in your own bible or on your app then please do now this i say and testify in the lord that you must no longer walk as the gentiles do in the futility of their minds they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, uh, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learnt Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members w one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, uh, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption." Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness, covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that in everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Make the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand that the will of the Lord, what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I've got to pray after reading that. Lord, would you help us this morning? Thank you for your word, but Lord, it, 
sometimes is really hard to read. Would you help it to become uh, like honey on our lips? Would you help it to sink into our hearts? Would you speak to us this morning? And Lord, I pray for humility as I uh, bring your word this morning and, and open it up and discuss it with others. Amen. Amen. I don't know if anyone's bought any new clothes recently. What do you think of my new coat, guys? I've got this lovely new coat. It's nice and gold. I thought I'd go for the gold look as we're approaching Christmas. Uh, so I've got a gold coat. Do you like the fact that they put the label on the outside? Uh, because this is the way that they wear it these days, that, you know, the cool kids, uh, they wear their clothes inside out. And uh, I'm, I'm not really serious. Uh, this is not my new coat. This is just a coat I turned inside out uh, to make a point. And uh, this morning, uh, I want to talk about inside out holiness, that God wants us to be holy from the inside out. Now, as a new people, that this is what we ought to be. A new people that are changed from the inside out. We should be known for being a church of people who are changed from the inside out. But the problem is, is often the church has become known for being an outside-in church. That we care about our appearance, that we pretend to look holy on the outside. Whereas actually there's a load of rot ugliness and sin on the inside and we've all seen it haven't we? we've seen church leaders and Christians being exposed uh, and the, the dark things that have happened in private in their lives have come into the light and suddenly people think they're just hypocrites these Christians hypocritical pretending to look good on the outside but messy and rotten on the inside and God wants us to be an inside-out church, to be changed on the inside so that when it begins to come and bear fruit on the outside, it's authentic change. It's not pretend change. We're an inside-out church. That's how God wants us to be. And he wants us to be different. We, we were doing spot the difference earlier, weren't we? He wants us to be different, marked as different, because Jesus was different. Jesus didn't blend in. You could never have said Jesus blended in to the crowd. He was different, and he was proud to be different. Why was he different? Because he was holy. Now, we only become holy from the inside out as a church when we actually start from the inside. <laughs> it might sound obvious, but it's true. We start from the inside, and that's where God wants to begin in all our lives, to begin with the heart, to begin with the inside uh, transformation. And we see that throughout the first four chapters of Ephesians, and particularly in chapter one, but because we don't have time to go into all of that, um, right now in lots of depth, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to the talks that are up on the YouTube channel or on the website uh, or read for yourself chapters one to four of the book of Ephesians. So, so get your head uh, immersed in this wonderful, wonderful truth about what God does on the inside of us. Uh, it's the gospel. It's the good news. Now, there's a lot of practical stuff about what it should then begin to look like on the outside in chapters 4 and 5. So what I've just read might sound really, really heavy. It might sound like a list of do's and don'ts. But it's only the fruit. This is the fruit. This is what happens when we allow God to do the work inside. We begin to then look different on the outside in the way we live our lives. And uh, I haven't got time this morning, and because there are little ears around, uh, there are some things in this passage which we can't talk about in great detail uh, <laughs> in this talk. So what I'm proposing is that I'm going to just talk about a little bit about what it looks like to be changed from the inside out, 
And then if any of you have any particular questions or things that you'd like to explore further uh, in this passage that you just heard read, maybe examples of what it looks like on the outside and the way we live, uh, then at the end, do stay on and we, we can have a little discussion time. Now, it's All Saints Day today. We've said that already. And I've made the point already that, that God sees us as saints when we are saved in Christ. And I want to prove that to you by uh, going back to chapter 1 uh, in Ephesians. And it will appear on the screen. Hopefully we've got a slide here, Kirsty, if we can have the next slide. Um, not that one. Okay, thank you. So we're changed from the inside out. Now, um, God calls us all saints. Here we've got someone who many of you will recognize as a well-known saintly person. You know, one of the holy, if you ask people in, in society, you know, who's the holiest person you can think of? Many people will, will go to this uh, lady on the right. Her name was Mother Teresa. She was, uh, 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 she's dead now, but she was a, um, a, a nun working with the poor in Calcutta in India and did amazing things. Um, and on the left, does anyone recognize this guy? No. So this, this man... Uh, is uh, a guy called Shane Taylor. And at one point, he was known as the most dangerous man in Britain uh, because of the violence that he committed. And he was imprisoned. Uh, he went on um, an Alpha course, which is a course run by lots of churches, and they run it in prisons, just helping people to discover who Jesus is and what Jesus has done uh, for us. And he became a Christian. As soon as he made that commitment, he became a saint. Now, it might feel a bit scandalous to say they're both saints. But you see, Paul, in the first verse of the first chapter in Ephesians, he addresses the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. He is addressing all Christians, all of the Christians, not just the church leaders, not just those who were particularly well behaved that year. He is addressing the saints because when we become uh, Christians, when we choose to put our trust in Jesus, we become saints, not sinners. And yet loads of us, I don't know about you, but loads of us think of ourselves as sinners. We often hear people say we're sinners saved by grace. Now there, that is true, but our identity now is we are saved. We're no longer sinners. That Our identity is that we are saints. And Paul addresses all of his letters to saints. He, he uses that language, to the saints. And then in, um, if we could just have the next, next slide, Kirsty, And the next one. Uh, and then in verse 4, just a couple of verses on, he says, he chose us in him. God chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. So not only are we are we addressed as saints? Not only is that our identity, but we were chosen before the creation of the world. He chose us to be presented as sinless before the Father. Now, to use the marriage analogy, which the Bible uh, uses this picture of marriage throughout the Bible, um, um, God has made it clear that he's chosen us to be his bride. Uh, knowing full well that we would be unfaithful and run off with other partners. He's chosen us knowing full well that we would be unfaithful. There's a, there's a particular book in the Old Testament that uh, God, um, God uses this picture of a, of a, of a marriage where the one partner is unfaithful just so that they can experience what it's like for God with us. And throughout the Old Testament, the people uh, kept being unfaithful. They kept worshipping other gods, forgetting God. And, um, and yet in the New Testament, we have hope because he's chosen us and he presents us as sinless. And uh, he, he has, we're no longer dead in sin. Uh, we're no longer stuck as slaves to sin, but alive in Christ. And we have, we have a secret weapon. We have him. We have him living in us. We have the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, living in us, whose job it is, is to help us to be a pure and spotless and faithful bride. 
the chapter two. But God, this is verse four. Next, next slide, Kirsty. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which He loved, with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trans, in our trespasses, uh, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Mercy and grace. Not just grace, but riches of grace. Now, if I was stopped by the police, which I talked a bit about last time, I confessed uh, my encounters with the police, um, but if I was stopped for speeding, which thankfully I've never been stopped for speeding yet, I've still not got a, um, a I've never been caught for that, um, and, uh, and, and so far I never had to do any of those tests or anything, um, and um, I'm, I'm not passing judgment on anyone who has. Uh, I know that it'd be very easy to, to get caught for speeding these days. It's so easy, isn't it? Um, and, uh, and it's often one of those little sins that God often convicts me about when I'm driving. Just, are you, are you going over the speed limit? Yeah, I think you are. Yeah, oh yeah, I think I am, yeah. And, um, but if, if I was stopped for speeding by the police, um, I would deserve, rightfully deserve a fine. But if the police officer lets me off the hook and doesn't give me a fine, that is an act of mercy. I don't get what I deserved. I don't get the punishment that I deserved for the act of sin. But because God is just, and because it's important that God is just, because we all recognize that our world is crying out for justice. Our world needs justice, so we need a just God. We can't just say God doesn't need to be just. He does need to be just, and so he can't just let us off the hook. Not like the police officer. He, he has to satisfy justice. And so the guilty must be punished for wrongdoing. Uh, in order for us to be let off the hook, though, a substitute must come and take our place. Must come and take the punishment uh, that we deserved. And so instead of us being on the hook, Jesus is hooked up to a cross. Jesus himself, God himself, places himself on the hook so that we can be let off the hook. Mercy. Such mercy. And this is what Paul is trying to remind us of. That we've got to start with that place of recognizing that we, we actually were deserving punishment. That we can't say that we weren't in the wrong. That Paul wants us to recognize that we needed mercy. We needed God to show us mercy. We needed Jesus as our substitute. He not only suffers, but because we were dead in our transgressions, uh, with no way of being able to climb out of our tombs of death, Jesus died and descended right into the pit of death where we were stuck. You know, the Bible says, Paul says that we were dead in our sin. Now, who knows that dead people can't get up and walk without someone making them alive again? And God made us alive in Christ by Jesus coming into the, the pit of death and grabbing our hands and saying, I've paid the price for you. Come up. So mercy. We escape the punishment that we deserve and we are made alive. Undeserved freedom. But many Christians want to redefine things here um, and it's certainly unpopular to say that we've sinned um, and no one wants to be reminded that we're, we were deserving of punishment. There, there are life choices that are against God's will. And w if we haven't sinned, then we don't receive mercy. Do you see what I'm saying? We've got to recognize that we've, we were sinners in order to, uh, for us to receive mercy. And um, I'd rather know that I've been set free from a prison than persuade myself uh, that I was never in a prison in the first place. And always wonder why I still feel bound to my feelings or what the Bible calls the flesh. So that's mercy, being let off the hook because Jesus placed himself on the hook for us. Then there's grace. Grace goes beyond mercy. Grace is like the policeman stopping me, wavering the fine, but then giving me a load of money to buy a new car. Grace goes way beyond mercy. Mercy lets me off the hook, but grace gives me 
so much more, gives me a new life, a new start, and gives me everything I need to then start living differently. To get a car which maybe has a a, a speed limiter on it. (laughs) And we have the Holy Spirit living in us like a speed limiter. It helps us, prevents us from, um, you know, giving us a check saying, are you sure you want to go over that speed limit? And I have this relationship with God now where God speaks to me in the car as I'm driving so that I can start making different life choices. We were destined for eternal separation from God because we were dead in our sin. But when Jesus died on the cross, mercy, he took our separation and our debt was cancelled. But then he rose from the grave and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. We are seated with him and given riches. That is grace. Amazing grace. No longer are you stuck having to live the old life. But you are now free and you're given riches and a new position. We become princes and princesses in the kingdom of God. Sons and daughters of the king. That is grace. Now that should help us realize that we can begin to live differently. Not because it's a list of do's and don'ts, but because we've got a new position, a new identity. We are now princes and princesses. And we begin to learn to live like princes and princesses, sons and daughters of the king. For those who heard this good news, this uh, gospel and said, I'm in, we are guaranteed the role of reigning with him in glory in the new creation. So if you're sitting here thinking, oh yeah, well I, I I said sorry for my sins to Jesus, and I invited him into my heart, but I know that I'm not living up to all of those standards that I just heard read when Rich read the, the, the verses. Uh, you know, I know I'm making mistakes. I know I'm living bad choices. And uh, does that mean I'm no longer getting into the kingdom of God? Well, grace and mercy says you're in. You no longer need to um, worry about that. But we need to start living like princes and princesses rather than living like uh, people who are dead in the pit. And this is what Paul is trying to help us see, that people who are saved, people who are sons and daughters of the king, need to start living differently. We need to start living differently in the kingdom. This is what it looks like to become a human fully alive. This is how God created us right in the beginning when he made Adam and Eve. Fully alive. Fully devoted to God. Fully living for Jesus. A fully alive humanity is seen when the church becomes holy from the inside out. When we realize that we were sinners saved by grace, now we can be called saints and we're sons and daughters of the king and we start to operate as a body on fire because we're holy from the inside out. Now many today want to say being fully human means you need to be true to your feelings, your passions, your sense of authentic self. I don't know if you've heard that before. Um, It's a It's a strong narrative. The Bible says your old self is corrupt through deceitful desires. Now, this is not easy to hear, and it's really difficult because I know that I feel like doing something one day and then feel different the next day, and and I might want to do something, but actually God says not all of those feelings are good for you. I'm either ruled by my passions or I'm ruled by God's passionate love for me. I'm either ruled by my passions or by God's passionate love for me. Now that transformation from death to life begins from the inside out. And it's essential that we let others see us being transformed. I don't know about you, but I, I get to the stage. I got to the stage. Um, now I'm, I still consider myself quite young, but I got to, I've been a Christian for a long time. And I got to the stage a while ago where I probably stopped changing I stopped becoming more like Jesus. It's really easy to stall as a Christian. You get to a stage and you think, well, I'm there. I'm, I'm kind of living, living well enough as a Christian. And I don't really want to change anymore, thank you. And uh, it's, it's really easy to get to stall uh, in our transformation. But it's so important that others see God's power 
transforming us from the inside out. And if we begin to stop inviting God to transform us and begin to maybe make that a bit more of a private thing and stop letting others see where God is working on our lives, there are some of you here, and I don't need to name names, but some of you here who are so good at this, so good at helping us see what God is doing in you because you're vulnerable. You are willing to be transparent about what God is doing in your life. And I want to encourage us that we, if we want to be uh, a witness to this, to Twerton, to Bath, that we need to be a people who allow others in. A, an inside-out people lets others see the labels on the back of our shirt. We allow others to see where it's a bit messy so that we be, they begin to see that God is changing us. Not keep those things quiet and private and hidden, now, that it's, we've got to find appropriate places and relationships to do that. So there are things in Paul's writing here, thing, examples of holiness that I really struggle with, but it would be inappropriate for me to talk about really publicly in this setting. But with a small group, I might open up a lot, a lot more easily. And I want to encourage you that we've got to get into those smaller settings where we can begin to open up and allow others to see us being transformed. Because there's a risk, you see, if we don't go for transparent transformation. The first risk is that we become a hypocrite, insisting on transformation but without transparency, pretending to be perfect on the outside but sinning in private. That's the first risk. The second risk is that we become a self-justifier Insisting on transparency but without transformation. Not hiding our private life but resisting any notion that we need to change. We need to be transparent and transformed. Allowing others to see what God is doing from the inside out. There's so much more I could say and if any of you want to stay on at the end to discuss it uh, further then please do hang on and we can have a discussion on what, what this actually looks like in, in practice. But I'm just going to pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for the, for the gift that Jesus gave us of freedom, of a, of a new identity as your sons and daughters. Thank you for mercy and grace. We thank you that you gave us your Holy Spirit to show, show us what it looks like to change from the inside out, so that we could be a holy people, marked out as different, and allowing others to see your transforming work in our lives. Help us, Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to bring our service to an end with communion, and uh,